You are going to listen to a talk about library system. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Right, everyone. My name is Kathy Smith. I'd like to give you a brief introduction about the library system. Every good student should learn how to use the library. If you have to do a research project, the library is the place to go to for information. Libraries contain books and periodicals, magazines and newspapers on many different subjects. To find the information you need, you must know how to use the library. All libraries are organised in much the same way. Every library has a collection of books. Many libraries also have periodicals, films, and records. All the books in a library can be classified under two main categories: fiction and non-fiction. Books of fiction contain stories that were made up by the author. Books of non-fiction contain factual material. When doing research, you use non-fiction books because you are looking for factual information. All the fictional books in a library are grouped in one section. They are arranged alphabetically by the last name of the author. Many libraries also label the spines of all books of fiction with the letters F I C or F. All libraries have a system for organizing and classifying non-fiction books. The most widely used system is the Dewey Decimal System. It was designed by an American librarian named Melvin Dewey. It is called a decimal system because it divides all non-fiction books into ten major categories. These are further divided into subdivisions. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen and answer questions five to ten. Divisions. For example, all science books are numbered from 500 through 599. Each different field of science has a number within the 500 category. For example, astronomy is 520, and chemistry is 540. The Dewey Decimal System provides a category for every type of non-fiction book. The best way to locate a book in the library is to use the card catalogue. The card catalogue is an index of all the books in the library. Information about a book is listed on cards. All the cards are filed alphabetically and stored in drawers in large cabinets. The card catalogue can help you locate a particular book, a book on a certain subject, or a book by a particular author. In the card catalogue, each book has three cards: an author card, a title card, and a subject card. The author card is alphabetized under the author's name. The title card is filed alphabetically according to the title of the book. The subject card is filed alphabetically under the name of the subject of the book. In many university libraries, they use their own bibliotis cataloging system or the microfiche system. Both of them list publications under author and title, and both are very easy to use. Now let us see the reference books. We all know that reference books make up important part of a library's non-fiction books collection. They contain facts and information about any subject you can think of. Reference books are not meant to be read from cover to cover. You should use them when you want important facts and information about a particular subject. Let's see some major types of reference books. First, dictionaries. Dictionaries are books that list and give the meanings of the words in a language. They also give the pronunciation of words in a dictionary, which are listed alphabetically. Second is encyclopedias. 
Encyclopedias are reference books that provide factual information about people, events, places, and subjects of lasting interest. Each article is written by a specialist on the topic being discussed. An encyclopedia usually consists of a number of books arranged in a set. The volumes are arranged in alphabetical order according to the topic of each article. Letters are stamped on the spine of each volume to indicate the alphabetical rang of the topics in each volume. For instance, if you wanted to find information about the moon, you would look in volume eight of the encyclopedia pictured here. Next is atlases. An atlas is a book of maps. It may contain many different kinds of maps. The maps in an atlas are often arranged alphabetically by country or continent. Almanacs are also a type of reference books. An almanac is a book that contains recent statistics and summaries of information on a wide variety of topics. It is published annually. Information is listed alphabetically by subject. Indexes are alphabetical lists of names, titles, and subjects that tell where information about each can be found in other publications. For example, the Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature can help you find magazine articles that have been published about a particular subject. It will give you the names of publications that have carried articles about the subject, the dates and volume numbers of the particular issue in which the articles appeared. You should be aware that reference books may not be taken out of the library under any circumstances; they are used only in the library. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. Two. You will hear part of a podcast for visitors to the popular holiday region called the Trelaw Valley. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fourteen. Now listen and answer questions eleven to fourteen. The valley and estuary of the River Trelaw forms an unspoiled, beautiful landscape, rich in both wildlife and sites of historic interest. There are many ways to explore the area, and public transport links are good. It is possible to leave your car behind and travel by boat, train, or bus. With just short walks in between stops, the Trelaw Valley Passenger Ferry runs between villages along the river estuary, and provides a link with a train station at Berry, which is about ten minutes walk from the riverside village of Calton. In the past, the river was the main form of transport in the area, and as in the past, today's ferry service operates according to nature. The river estuary is tidal, and so the ferry timetable differs from day to day, according to the times and height of the tide. The ferry is also seasonal, normally running between April and September, depending on the weather. A timetable for the whole year can be downloaded from the internet by visiting www.trelawferry.co.uk. If you just want to sit and relax and enjoy the lovely scenery, you can take a river cruise to Calton and back from the nearby city of Plymouth. In the past, steamships brought early tourists along the same route. Queen Victoria and her family enjoyed such a trip in 1856. The journey is quicker these days. 
The round trip takes between four and five hours, depending on tides and weather. If you prefer, you can travel upriver by boat and return to Plymouth by train. All cruise boats and trains have wheelchair access. For more information and for departure times, ring Plymouth Boat Cruises on 017-528-23104. Trains run several times a day throughout the year between Calton and Plymouth, with various stops in between. They are used by both local commuters and tourists who want to enjoy the beautiful scenery. The highlight of the journey is crossing the river on the stunning viaduct, which was built at the beginning of the 20th century and towers 120 feet over the water. It is unnecessary to book, and tickets can be bought on the train. For information about fares and timetables, contact National Rail Inquiries by phone or online. The bus service in the Trelore Valley now connects all train stations and villages in the area. Especially for holidaymakers, there's a rover ticket which can be used at weekends and on national holidays and allows unlimited journeys on those days. The rover ticket provides great value for money and is now even cheaper than it was last year. An adult ticket costs £5.50 a day. Senior citizens can travel for £4.50, and a family ticket for up to five people costs just £12. Tickets can be bought on the bus. Now you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. At the center of the Trelore Estuary area is the historic riverside village of Kelton. The main road comes into the village from the south, and for those of you who are arriving by bus, it turns left just before the bridge and stops in the lay-by on the left-hand side. From there, it's just a short walk to Kelton's various attractions, if you're arriving by car, you have to leave it in the main car park. Go over the bridge and take the first turning on the right. Then go on until you come to the end of that road. It's the only place to park in Calton, but there's no charge. If you're interested in local history, there's a museum in Calton with farming, fishing, and household implements from the late 19th century. As you come in from the south, Cross the river and go straight on the same road until you reach the end. Also, on the subject of history, you can go and see the old mill, which has recently been renovated and put back into use. Turn left before you come to the bridge, then go straight on and then take the first turning on the right. This leads straight there. If you're interested in arts and crafts, there's a potter's studio where you can watch the artist at work. After crossing the bridge, turn left, and it's the second building on the left. Finally, when you feel in need of refreshments, there's a cafe opposite the old boathouse and a picnic area near the mill. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between Caesar 
and a welfare officer. As you listen, answer questions 11 to 20. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Good afternoon. My name's Cesar Bautisto. Hello, I'm Wendy, one of the welfare officers. Can I help you? Yes, I have to move out of my accommodation in two weeks and I can't find anywhere else to live. OK, I'll need to know some details about your current situation. I'm an overseas student from the Philippines. The college gave me a temporary room for one month. I can't find anywhere else and I have no money. Have you told the college about your position or asked them to let you stay longer in your accommodation? No, not yet. I, I didn't think that would be possible. Well, we can contact the accommodation service on your behalf to see if they'll let you stay a little longer until you can find an alternative. Thank you. But I'm not sure that I can find another place, as they all ask for money before moving in, and I don't have any. Yes, it is usual in this country for landlords to ask for up to a month's rent in advance. Don't you have any money at all? Hardly any. I'm waiting for my grant check to be sent from the Philippines at the moment. It should have been here for me to collect when I arrived in Britain, but it seems to have been lost. You can apply for emergency loan from the union if you want. The loan can be for up to £200, and we ask for a post-dated cheque for the same amount to be given to us so that we can recover the money once you receive your grant cheque. That would be very good. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. I'll apply, but I'm still worried about how to find new accommodation. As I said earlier, we can ask the college to extend the time you're allowed to stay in your present accommodation. They may refuse, of course. Then what will happen? If the worst comes to the worst, the union may be able to provide some very short-term emergency accommodation. If you want me to, I'll contact one or two of the addresses on the notice board and arrange for you to visit them. But what if they ask me for the rent in advance? I only have £90 left and I need that for food and books. It'll be all right. By the time they actually need the money, we'll have your emergency loan ready. Just fill in this application form and write me a cheque for £200, please. Payable to the student union. Right, I'll do that. Thank you very much for your help. I'm feeling more optimistic now. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk about memory in babies and young children. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. We are going to look today at some experiments that have been done on memory in babies and young children. Our memories, it's true to say, work very differently, depending upon whether we are very old, very young, or somewhere in the middle. But when exactly do we start to remember things? And how much can we recall? One of the first questions that we might ask is, do babies have any kind of episodic memory? Can they remember particular events? Obviously, we can't ask them, so how do we find out? Well, one experiment that's been used has produced some interesting results. It's quite simple and involves a baby in its cot, a colourful mobile and a piece of string. It works like this. If you suspend the mobile above the cot and connect the baby's foot to it with the string, the mobile will move every time the baby kicks. Now you can allow time for the baby to learn what happens and enjoy the activity. Then you remove the mobile for a time and reintroduce it some time from 1 to 14 days later. If you look at this table of results, at the top two rows, you can see that what is observed shows that two-month-old babies can remember the trick for up to two days and three-month-old babies for up to a fortnight. And although babies trained on one mobile will respond only if you use the familiar mobile, if you train them on a variety of colours and designs, they will happily respond to each one in turn. Now, looking at the third row on the table, you will see that when they learn to speak, babies as young as 21 months demonstrate an ability to remember events which happened several weeks earlier. And by the time they are two, some children's memories will stretch back over six months, though their recall will be random, with little distinction between key events and trivial ones. And very few of these memories, if any, will survive into later life. So, we can conclude from this that even very tiny babies are capable of grasping and remembering a concept. So, how is it that young infants can suddenly remember for a considerably longer period of time? Well, one theory accounting for all of this, and this relates to the next question we might ask, is that memory develops with language. Very young children with limited vocabularies are not good at organising their thoughts. Though they may be capable of storing memories, do they have the ability to retrieve them? One expert has suggested an analogy with books on a library shelf. With infants, he says, it's as if early books are hard to find because they were acquired before the cataloguing system was developed. But even older children forget far more quickly than adults do. In another experiment, several six-year-olds, nine-year-olds and adults were shown a staged incident. In other words, they all watched what they thought was a natural sequence of events. The incident went like this. A lecture, which they were listening to, was suddenly interrupted by something accidentally overturning. In this case, it was a slide projector. To add a third stage, and make the recall more demanding, this accident was then followed by an argument. In a memory test the following day, the adults and the nine-year-olds scored an average 70% and the six-year-olds did only slightly worse. In a retest five months later, the pattern was very different. The adults' memory recall hadn't changed, but the nine-year-olds had slipped to less than 60%, and the six-year-olds could manage little better than 40% recall. In similar experiments with numbers, digit span that is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.